right. Okay. Thank you, thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for joining us today for our amazing career conversation. And uh, I'd like to welcome our very special guest today, Craig Stevens, who is a painter and is an artist and is an entrepreneur, and I am super, super excited to touch bases with him about all the things. And on that note, I'd like to welcome Craig Steven. Hi, everybody. <laughs> all right. Well, Craig, can you start by introducing yourself and telling us a little bit about yourself? Well, I am Craig Stevens, and I don't know if any of you know Becky Stevens. She's a math teacher, and she might be your math teacher, um, but I'm a uh, I live out in the woods up in Auburn, and I taught high school art for 23 years, and I don't do that anymore. My, my sort of side job of painting has sort of taken over, and I have a degree in fine art from UC Davis. I got That's interested beautiful. in art and drawing back when I was just a kid reading Marvel comics and copying my favorite artists out of the comics that I collected. Which I still have. There's a I have a rack of vintage Marvel comics in my studio out here and in my home. Um, and little by little, I just started, uh, you know, learning more about about different mediums, drawing, painting, and um, went to art school. Graduated a long time ago in 1993. Got a job teaching art, and um, at some point, I decided I wanted to paint more. And I ran into a guy named Dwayne Kaiser who started this thing called a painting a day. And that's where you start and finish one small painting every day. And I mean, every day, holidays, birthdays, days when you don't feel like it every single day. And I thought, well, that's a good way to get better at something. So I did that and I didn't miss a day for like a thousand days. And I got a lot better at painting and I got a lot more comfortable with a small format. And I started selling the small paintings on eBay um, eventually eBay, which is a great program. And if you're just starting out, it kind of comes with a built-in customer base, but you pay a lot of fees and the fees are worth it. But if you can get away with not paying the fees, that's better. So now I have my own website and I have a pretty good following on Instagram. I teach classes remotely and I do paintings and sell them for my website. So. Wow. That's amazing. So a thousand days in a row, you did a painting. That's every serious, day that's some serious <laughs> commitment <laughs> yeah where so when i started you, that in, where do you draw your um your inspiration a thousand days in a row uh it's just it's honestly it's just whatever's laying around um initially and like when you're in art school you want to always paint something that's like important you want to do something that's art historically um significant because you feel like you're going to be famous someday but that's none of that stuff is important. The important thing is to paint and to observe the world around you and to be engaged with what you're doing when you're painting. And I realized very quickly, if you're going to paint every day, you can't, you can't take time. I have like on my table right here, I have this, right? Eggshells, right? We have chickens. They have really beautiful eggs. And I just saved them because I'm going to do a painting of these at some point. Um, very cool. Kids toys. Cool. These are super fun to paint. Um, I, I picked some dandelions that I'm going to paint today. So just whatever's around. And even if you don't feel like painting, once you get started, once you get engaged in the process, it becomes interesting because everything is interesting if you look at it, like really look at it. So I love that. And you are going to do something super special for us today. What do you have in mind? Well, let me, uh, let me show you what my reference is that I'm going to use. And I'm not I am not, here's, this is a photograph of what I'm looking at in real life. I don't know if you guys can see this. Okay, it's a little dandelion puff with a flower. I have some vintage bottles. Um, and I have a piece of gray construction paper on my stage that I'm using for the backdrop. Um, and that's it, and that's what I can see. I can see that in real life. I don't use photographs for reference. I like to paint from life. But when I teach classes online, it's, it's a lot. I don't, have a, I don't have a separate camera pointing at my stage, so it's easier just to uh, you know, share a picture. Um, and my setup looks like this. Okay. Can you guys all see that? So this piece of glass, this is a piece of glass mounted on a piece of plywood and glass makes a nice palette because I can use a, I can use one of these razors to scrape it off and clean it. This is a piece of, um, hardboard. Sometimes it's known as masonite. 
that I, you know, I buy it by the four by eight sheet and then I cut it up and prime it myself. And these panels, this is a five by seven inch panel. And it, you know, if you buy a four by eight sheet of this, you can probably get a hundred panels this size out of a sheet that size. And they end up costing you about 10 or 12 cents a piece. So it's very economical. Um, and, uh, and it's a nice surface to paint on. I like controlling my own surface. I don't really like canvas to paint on. It's, it's a fine thing if you like it, but I just don't like, I don't care for this, the texture. Um, so when I start, I wanna mix a little paint with some paint thinner and I have too much thinner in there. <laughs> it's too, too, too runny. You wanna like that, you wanna be like ink. Um, and I usually make a line in the middle to sort of set up where I'm gonna be. It doesn't really matter what color you use. I like warm colors though. You know, my little bottle is going to be about that big. I'm not doing anything fancy with the with the, the composition here. I just want to put it in the middle. And then I want to do something that is fairly convincing, you know, as being a kind of a real looking thing. We'll see what I can do in a half hour here. And if you guys have any questions about the process of painting or what it takes to, uh, um, you know, be a, be a full-time artist and make a living doing that, because I'll tell you, it's not all fun and games. <laughs> it's not all painting. Um, but I'm happy to discuss any portion of the process with you. Awesome. Well, I do have the first question. Do you feel a little bit like Bob Ross right now? <laughs> um, I do, but I have, as you can see, uh, this is one way I'm not like Bob Ross. I don't have his, uh, his fancy do. Um, and I, you know, when you're a, when you're a serious art student, you know, and when I say serious, I mean like you're a freshman in college and you think you're serious, you think you're cool. People like Bob Ross, you're like, oh, you know, that guy's too accessible. He's not edgy. But the more I learn about Bob Ross, the more respect I have for that gentleman. He, uh, he was a real professional and, um, you know, he, he did what made him happy and he used it to make other people happy. And the guy really knew how to paint and he kind of broke it down to sort of like a formula, which, you know, you all have, to, everyone has to find their own formula. They have to find their own deal that works for them. So, you know, that, that part, if it's a step, if it gets your foot in the door and it gets you painting, then I'm all for it. So I don't know if I have as many catchphrases as Bob Ross, but. <laughs> what are you using right now? Um, this is a palette knife. And I use this to mix color. This is oil paint and oil paint stays wet uh, or workable for a really long time. Right now I'm mixing up a medium gray to use as my background color. So I use some blue, a little bit of red, um, which made some, which made kind of a purple. And then I added a little bit of yellow because the yellow will cancel that purple out and kind of gray it down a little bit. So you can still see this, my gray has a little bit of a violet cast to it. So this is gonna be my background color. I love it. Somebody in the chat like asked color. what kind of paint you're using. Uh, this is oil paint. And the brand I use, I use Lucas 1862. It's a professional oil painting color. Um, I like it because it comes in these gigantic tubes. <laughs> and I use a lot of paint. And it also it dries faster than any other oil paint I've ever used. The oil paint could take up to a month or even a couple months to dry completely. Um, so wow. you wanna... how, much, how much does it cost? Uh, you know what? That's a great question. And it really, it varies by um, color. A color that has a lot of cadmium in it. This is cadmium orange. A tube this size probably, I want to say runs about $70. Um, I, get, I get it online and I get a pretty good deal. Um, the white that I use, a titanium white, probably about $20 for this. Um, there are some, there's some brands that are much more, that are, they're more expensive because they're made in smaller batches. Um, so you could pay for a very, for a small tube, for a tube this size, a 37 milliliter tube. I've seen certain colors of blue go for in excess of 200 bucks for a small tube like that. Oh my goodness gracious. So, you know, I'm not, I'm not that fancy or famous to buy that stuff, but this is a really good quality, um, professional quality paint that is, uh, functions really well. And I do, I love the drawing time. The fast drawing time is wonderful. So another so question that came across the chat. Yeah. Uh, Rebecca's 
wondering if you paint faces. I do. I do sometimes do that. And in fact, I wrote a book. Um, and instead of using a uh, photograph of me on the cover, I'm going to run over and grab it as an example. So this is a reasonably good. Uh, I did OK on this, I think. This is wow. the self-portrait I did for the back of my book. Oh, so. wow. Love that. Um, for me, it, you know, it helps if I'm familiar with the person uh, and I'm not intimidated. I, like, I hardly ever paint my wife if she's on just because I painted her and drew, drawn her a couple of times a long time ago, but I just don't, she's so beautiful to me. I don't feel like I can ever really capture that. So I, I, I kind of gave up, you know, it's bad for my self-esteem when I don't feel like I'm nailing it, you know. <laughs> um, but yeah, in general, I can paint, I can paint portraits fairly well. That's not necessarily what I specialize in. Love that. What's your favorite um, Marvel book or hero? Well, I'll tell you, I, I have been collecting comic books since I was, I don't know, probably 10 years old. And, and back in those days, there were no movies. Everything was in comic books, which is something to think about. The entire Marvel universe wasn't created you know, everybody thinks, oh, it's like hundred million dollar movies that employ like thousands, tens of thousands of people. And it's this giant, you know, popular culture thing. But that was created mostly by Jack Kirby and Stan Lee, which were two guys with a typewriter, some paper and some pencils. And they made everything up. So when I was a kid, I loved Spider-Man and I liked Spider-Man because he was a kid. And now that I'm old, I like Captain America because he's old, <laughs> uh, but I still like Spider-Man. So um, don't don't uh, don't get me wrong. Spider-Man's great. There are Spider some also like cool old thing. version Spider-Man. What's that? There are old versions of Spider-Man. That's true. If you look in the current movie, they have you know Tobey Maguire's older, um, and uh, yeah, yeah. So there is that, and that's kind of nice. That's kind of fun. That's the nice thing about comic books. You can make anything you want happen without having to pay actors or special effects people. Everything just happens, you know, by, by drawing it. And that's really what got me interested in drawing in the first place. So it, you can create entire universes with, with very inexpensive stuff coupled with your imagination. So don't, if you draw, don't ever stop. It's a shame to not exercise that muscle. Absolutely. All right, let's see what I can do. So I had another question come across the chat that says, are you, are there tips or tricks you could give to give more of an oil paint feel? I try, but I always end up putting too much detail and I feel like I can't get it. Or I can't well, get it. so do you mean an oil paint feel with oil paint? Um, Rebecca, do you want to unmute and ask? Uh, sure. Um, I personally draw digitally so i guess i'm ah. trying to replicate it for years now well, but i just can't seem to get it i would suggest that you um actually use oil paint and that'll give you that'll give you um that'll give you some more insight into how oil paint feels when you put it down and how it how it looks when it goes on um i think i know what you mean by putting too much detail in because my um you know, sort of my, my natural tendency is to make stuff really detailed. Um, but I'm going to have to work fast on this little painting. So I'm going to try and pare it down. So I'm not making so much detail. This is glass. So I can see through it. Uh, I can see this background through it. Um, and, you know, our, no matter how detailed we try to get, painting is always, always an act of simplification. And why is that? We're going from three dimensions to two dimensions. And that's always going to be simpler. So, you know, and I know when I was younger, I wanted every single piece of detail in there. But you just, you're never going to be able to get it. So you have to figure out what the important details are. And that's become easier for me as I get older because my eyesight is not as great as it was when I was your age. And so everything's kind of blurry to me anyway. 
you know, I would, I would say blurry. That's kind of an overstatement, but I, I can see less detail. And I, but and partly that's because I've sort of trained myself to see less detail. Uh, and that's, I'm fine with that. I just want to hit, I just want to hit the important parts. So right now I'm just kind of blocking in the big colors, getting the big picture in. And I'll throw in some background in here in a minute. And hopefully this will start to come together a little bit. Uh, I absolutely love that you paint every day, but I'm very curious about what a day in the life looks like. Oh my goodness. Um, so we, we get up, um, both of our kids, we have a seven and a half year old who's in um, second grade. Our girl just turned five. She is uh, in preschool. So I wake up, I wake everyone else up. Um, I get the kids going. Um, my wife starts to get ready and helps get the kids ready, which doesn't help. We, we are a complete team getting the kids ready. Um, mm -hmm. And then uh, get it once everyone's at school. Um, usually she starts teaching uh, out. We have a little, there's a building next to my studio that is a, it's like a little cottage that um, when, when David is here, who's our other son, who's 19, when he's here and not at his dad's, He's living there, but during the week, that's my wife's classroom. Um, my, my studio is right next to it. And that's my, uh, you know, that's my classroom where I teach. So once the kids are at school, Mrs. Stevens will start teaching and I will either teach a class or start painting. Um, but it's not all about painting because if no one knows about your work, if no one knows your stuff, uh, you know, and who's gonna buy it? So a lot of the stuff I do is marketing. When I do a painting, I have to post it to social media, you know, Facebook, Instagram, because I want it out there. I want people to know about it. Um, some days I have to ship paintings. So I'll have like, I don't know, half a dozen little paintings. I got to pack them up, wrap them up, put them in, a, um, you know, uh, mailing containers and print postage and deliver them to the uh, post office. Uh, but mostly I like, and sometimes I have to ship stuff, but I would rather just paint. So I just neglect that which is terrible business practice. Um, <laughs> hopefully none of you are my customers waiting for a painting to show up. Uh, <laughs> Chad, I just want to point out, and I actually need to address this as well because I didn't know this. Um, we actually had somebody in the chat mention that they love following your Instagram. So I didn't know you had an Instagram. Is that where you post your daily paintings? It is, and I can show you, I have it up. I can share that with you really quickly. Um, Let's see. So yeah, this is my Instagram page. Um, and you can see I painted dandelions very recently. Love this. Uh, I have an advertisement for a new class. Uh, in one wow. day, I did four little dinosaur paintings. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, so uh, I have a book. Here's my book coming out. So I have to, I'm obligated to, uh, you know, share book stuff because of my publisher. They, and they're very nice, but they're like, yeah, tell promote this. So I do a lot of sketchbook work. That's what the middle one here is uh, just some flipping through a sketchbook, but mostly these are, uh, you know, daily paintings or little time-lapse videos of me doing things. Um, you know, so that's what my Instagram page looks like. Love that. I'm kind of obsessed so. with the Chuck Taylor. That's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I, when I taught high school, I had students would bring me shoes. They'd bring me their old shoes. Um, and so I have a pretty good collection of different colors, different colored Chuck Taylors that I uh, um, have collected over the years. Um, someone was asking if you do drawings or do you just stick to paintings? Oh, no, I have I have many, many, many sketchbooks. And uh, most of my sketchbooks, believe it or not, I still draw Marvel characters. I'll go through old sketchbook or old comic books and I'll find pictures that I like. And just for practice, I will copy them. Um, because really drawing and painting both, it's just shapes. You're just making shapes on paper. And the more practice you get doing that, uh, the better. Uh, you can see on this flower, I am not painting every single petal here. I'm just making, you know, there's a dark area, darker yellow and a lighter area where the light is striking. And I'll probably throw some more detail in that later, but for now, that's really all I need. And you can see I'm using a pretty big paintbrush. 
So whoever asked the question about like over detailing a painting, when you're using uh, actual paint, and you could probably do the same thing digitally, one of the best pieces of advice I ever got in painting was use the biggest brush that you can for as long as you can, because that is going to force you to generalize and simplify. And that's a good thing. The more I can pare down the painting to what I find important, uh, the better it's going to be for my viewer. They don't want to, you know, if they want to see the real thing, they'll look at the real thing or they'll take a picture with their phone. But I'm trying to make a statement here that is, uh, you know, gets down to the essence of the thing I'm painting, or at least what I, what I found interesting. And in this case, I, my, my stem is way off center. <laughs> Notice I have more, I have more uh, flower on this side. So my stem should really be coming more through there. And you can paint on top of stuff if you want. Or I can just scrape it off a little bit, scrape a little bit of that paint off. Have you always uh, known that you wanted to be an artist? Uh, yes. Uh, but that leads you to the question, like, what does that even mean? You know, what is what is being an artist, right? I, you know, when I was a kid, I thought, well, I'll be like Jack Kirby or, or uh, you know, Steve Ditko or the guys that I watched drawing uh, my favorite comic books. I thought, I'll be a comic book artist. But how on earth do you become that, you know? I was a kid living in Weimar, California, and comic books, of course, were published in New York City. I was, I was never going to go to New York City. <laughs> um, and back in those days, that's what you had to do. It wasn't like today where you have YouTube videos that show you how to do stuff. You can do correspondence courses online. Um, now you could do something like that. Um, but anyway, I, I thought I wanted to paint comic books or draw comic books, um, which is very difficult, by the way. Uh, comic book artists are among the most skilled artists on the planet. They have to be able to draw every single thing from a car to a telephone to people fighting with superpowers. Uh, it's pretty remarkable what they, what they have to get done. Um, they also have to make the person look kind of the same on each and every page, which I'm not good at doing. Absolutely. That. And that takes a lot of practice. I, I did. I have self-published a couple of comics and I, did, I made what's called a maquette. A maquette is like a little model that you sculpt out of clay. I use Sculpey. It's that clay that you could bake in the oven. And I use that as my, uh, um, you know, I made a little figures of these characters. And you can uh, turn them at whatever angle you want, and it helps you get your drawings a little bit more consistent. Um, but making comic books is very time-consuming. Oh, yeah. Ridiculously time-consuming. And there's... Um, I, I, Sorry. Go ahead. Someone in the chat asked, uh, sorry, they said this a while ago, but they asked how many um, colors you use for a painting. Well, in this one, I actually have quite a few. I have, I have cobalt blue. I have a color called Elizabeth and Crimson, which is a really deep, deep red, kind of a cool red. I have cad, cadmium red light, cadmium yellow medium, and cadmium yellow light. So often, though, I'll just pick one version of blue, red, and yellow. In this case, I, there's a lot of yellows in the flower, so I wanted to use two yellows. And I don't know why I have two reds. I could get away with just one. Um, but, you know, this deeper red makes a nice, a nice kind of dirty orange, which works really well for the uh, um, flower. So sometimes just three, sometimes as many as this, sometimes five, and, of course, white, um, which you kind of need for tinting, tinting things. What's so the first you've the ever shipped painting? What's the what? The furthest you've ever shipped a painting. Uh, I have shipped paintings to virtually, let's see. I have shipped paintings to every continent except Antarctica. No way. <laughs> yeah. Wow, that's uh, amazing. So, so uh, Russia, Taiwan, um, all over Europe, uh, England, Ireland, Germany. Uh, I just shipped one to Germany. I had a gentleman just joined a class that I'm teaching who lives, he lives in Germany. So he's going to have to figure out what the time difference is. <laughs> um, Japan. Wow. Yeah. I, 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 it's an amazing age to live and be an artist because you, you do have access to so many people, you know? Right. I'm um, just because of the internet. 
do you have to do a bunch of advertising? I mean, aside from Instagram, or is that is that mostly where you advertise from? No, that's all. It's all Instagram. Um, I've been on Instagram since 2014, which is a long time. Um, and I'm very lucky that I, I have a lot of pretty loyal followers. Um, and a lot, a lot of times I'll post a painting and it will sell within, you know, 20 minutes of posting. So, wow. oh my goodness. And sometimes I'll do a painting that's, that I feel like is really good and, and it won't sell. And I, I get I get filled with doubt, self doubt. I'm like, oh my god, why didn't someone buy that cool dinosaur painting I just did? Um, you know, the one I did a month ago sold right away. Uh, but then, you know, if, if it's a good painting, that oh, they always sell eventually. So, That's and if they don't, I just have a sale. <laughs> and, and move it along. <laughs> one of the chat questions that just came across: uh, Do people ask for self portraits? If so, would you mind sharing the basic process of that? I know that. <laughs> Portraits obviously require a photo, but how does that work with the client and yourself? Ah, well, I will tell you. So if it's the only person that I can paint a self-portrait of is myself. <laughs> <laughs> so if someone were to ask me to paint their portrait, that would automatically not be a self-portrait. That would just be a portrait. It'd be a commission for someone. So just to get the terminology sort of straight. Um, and yes, I have been commissioned to do portraits of other people. And it's always difficult to do working from a photo because as you guys probably know, a photograph doesn't always tell the whole story. Like you probably have seen photographs of yourselves that don't really look that much like you. Um, you know, you're recognizable, but maybe it's not the perfect picture. And so usually I ask people to send me several pictures uh, from different angles and in different lighting situations so I can get a little bit better handle of, of what they actually look like. Um, and you know, then I just kind of go from there. I, I let them know what photograph I'm going to use. Sometimes I do a small sketch in gouache. Gouache is a little bit different. It's a different painting medium. It's, it's a little bit quicker than oil. It dries very fast. So I'll maybe do some small studies to kind of figure things out and send them their way. So they can, they can either say, yeah, I like where you're going on this or no, I, I, I don't care for that at all. Give me my money back. <laughs> um, which has actually never happened, thankfully. But um, it could, and I would, because you know I want people to be happy with what I'm doing. Um, but yeah, um, that's one reason why um, portraits are so difficult. And some artists make a really good living doing that. But you know, if this painting doesn't look exactly like my dandelions, no one, except for you guys, is ever gonna see those dandelions. And so as long as I get them to look like some kind of dandelion and the painting is good, the painting is interesting and has a nice rhythm to it and the paint quality is solid, it'll be a good painting and someone is going to be interested in out there. But in a portrait, if you don't capture the likeness of that person you've been commissioned to paint, uh, it's, it's, the, it's a hard fail. So uh, yeah, commissions are tough or portrait commissions are tough, so. We had another question in the chat asking if you clean your brush every time you switch colors. That's a great question. No, I don't. Um, well, I do one of two things. So I have a rag, I have a cotton rag right next to me. And sometimes I just take the brush and I just wipe the color out. So if I'm working like in one color family, like I have the background family here, if I'm moving from kind of dark to light, I'll just wipe the brush out, no big deal. Um, because if a little bit of the light gets in the dark, it's not, it's not really noticeable. If I'm moving in this color family, again, not a problem. But if I switch families, right? So if I move from here to yellow, this dull gray is really going to affect that yellow. It's going to make it a lot less bright. So I'm, I switch it around on my thinner and then I wipe it out. I have to make sure I get all of the solvent out of the brush, though, because a little bit of thinner getting in your paint kind of contaminates it and makes it a... Uh, makes it really soupy and really hard to handle. So you have to make sure your brushes are very dry if you dip them in the thinner. So there are a ton of chat questions coming across about your art classes. And I know you offer them, but can you talk to that a little bit? Yeah. So I, I limit them to 10, 10 participants and they're all online. I, I occasionally, before the big COVID thing happened, I would do some stuff in person. 
uh, either at a different location or sometimes I could handle up to three or four students in my studio. Um, but now I've, since the pandemic, I've gone a hundred percent online and I, I really like it. I can, I can teach more people. I can reach people in faraway places. Um, the classes are, we usually meet five times once a week. Um, use like, so for example, I'm doing a class now this Thursday afternoons from three to five o'clock and it's for five Thursdays. Uh, and the cost is $350 for all five Thursdays. My students have, I record all the, um, all these sessions. So if you miss a class or you just want to watch it again, uh, you have access to that recording for a couple months after the end of the class. We usually start by looking at each other's, I look at my students' work and we just sort of go over it. How could we make it better? Um, what things were successful? What things were challenging? We kind of go over student work and then I do a demo just like this, but I talk a lot more about what I'm doing than I am in this particular one. Like I would, I would say precisely what colors I'm using to mix and what the, what the idea behind using that color is, what the rationale is. Um, so, and that's, they're, uh, they generally fill up pretty fast. Um, and they're just a lot of fun to do. You know, I have people all over the world taking it. It's an interesting time we live in. So, and I do oil painting and I also do gouache classes. Gouache is a, it's a water-based medium. It's basically, it's, um, it's opaque watercolor. So watercolor, most watercolor that you guys are familiar with is gonna be transparent watercolor. And that's where the white of the paper shows through and it's your lightest light. It's usually your white. Any white in your painting is left over from paper that didn't get covered. Gouache, you actually have the option, you have white paints and you can mix it with your colors and you can paint over stuff. It's really fun. It's hard to use, but it's fun. I don't want to say it's hard to use. It's just, uh, it's different from what most people are used to. And so it's a little challenging at first. And so I use a knife to put on the paint later on. So we have another student <laughs> question about oil paints. Uh, she yeah. said, question out of curiosity, I've heard that oil paints behave differently in regards to color when blending. Is this true? Uh, different from what? Like different from acrylics or watercolors? I would assume so. So the thing about watercolors, like I said, watercolors are transparent. And when you have, when you have a thin transparent coat of paint and you can see a little bit of that white of the paper or your panel showing through, it makes your colors more luminous. It gives off, they give off more light and the colors will be much brighter. Um, and you can do the same thing with oil paint. I could thin the oil paints down. I could put a real thin passage on and make it transparent. But typically oil paints are opaque. They cover completely. And I like to paint with them in an opaque sort of manner um, where I'm just sort of covering over um, everything. And I can, I can block out mistakes like you saw in that stem. It was pretty easy for me to move that stem over because I could paint stuff over. Um, so uh, yeah, they, they, they mix differently than other paints like acrylics or gouache or watercolor just because um, you know, paint is made up of primarily of two things, made up of a, a binder. And that's kind of, you can think of that as like the glue that sticks the pigment down. So with oil paint, it's linseed oil. Um, with acrylic, it's an acrylic emulsion. It's like a man-made kind of almost like a glue. Um, with watercolor, it's gum arabic, which is a natural sort of a, it's almost like a type of tree sap, um, which becomes soluble again, by the way. When you get, when you get watercolors wet after they dry, they get wet again. Oil paints, when they dry, they're dry. You can't, you can't make them wet or workable again after they're dry. Same with acrylics. Um, but all of those things mix and blend differently because of the different binders that are used to hold the paint together. And I don't know if I could really describe it. The best way is just get some paint and kind of compare and see, see what you like. Um, one of the primary differences with oil paint is that they, they have a really, really long drying time. This paint that's on my palette will stay workable for days. Um, whereas if it was acrylics, they would already be dry. They'd be starting to dry already, which, which is neither good nor bad. It's just a matter of what you're used to. Um, I like it when stuff stays wet because you can move it around more easily. Love that. So you can see my, I use a knife not only to uh, mix my colors, but also to uh, 
you know, later on when I want to lay stuff on pretty thick. And I just like the nature of the marks. Yeah, I love the texture that it's creating. It's beautiful. Yeah, paint, oil paint has a lot of uh, a lot of that sort of textural quality. It's kind of um, it's you know you can do this a similar thing with acrylics, but oil is really it has a really wonderful nature in that respect. But, uh, I can I'm gonna use a brush. Some of these edges here where the light hits the dark are a little abrupt, and I can use this soft brush to just sort of drag those around and just soften those edges up, soften those transitions up a little bit. So different tools make different kinds of marks, different kind of quality of your marks. Do a lot of paper towels. We had a question in the chat about when you sold your first art piece. I'm sure you remember what it was too. Really? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> um, the first, well, the first painting I sold from a gallery was probably... I want to say 1988 or 89. It was a big, big, it was actually a big portrait and it was segmented into a bunch of sections. So I had 25 small panels that were all put together and I made this giant painting of Albert Einstein. And that sold from a gallery. And I painted that, I used to be a commercial sign painter. I painted billboards and stuff like that. And I used a lot of sort of billboard technique techniques on this big painting that I did. Um, and someone liked it and bought it. Wow. And then I ironically moved on to painting very small things and uh, selling those. So, but I honestly, I couldn't tell you when the first small painting like this was sold. Uh, probably in 2006, 2007, it might've been a clove of garlic. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> We just had a chat question about a Pokemon. Have you ever painted a Pokemon? I have absolutely painted Pokemon. <laughs> yeah, I am. Um, you know, I have always had, you know, I have kids. And in high school, you know, high school kids a lot of times are, are too cool for Pokemon, but they don't fool me. They think they're, they like them, you know? And so I would do demos in my class in high school and I would just take whatever you know, a Pokemon card and go, well, whatever this character is, um, probably Pikachu, you know, he's pretty popular. Uh, and uh, just do a quick little demonstration painting. So yeah, I painted Pokemon, I painted all kinds of stuff. That's amazing. I'm using my knife to soften this back edge here. I want the, I want the back edge of my stage where the stage meets my uh, backdrop. I want that edge, that horizontal edge to be really soft. Cause it'll make it, it'll make, it'll de-emphasize it and it will make it look kind of farther away. Love this. Okay. Interesting question came across. When painting faces for the, uh, for the lighting, do you follow the direction of the light or the direction of the face strokes? Oh, good question. Um, so when you talk about the direction of the face strokes, I think you're talking about the contour. Um, you know, because it's a, it's a wrap, face is a round thing. It's in three dimensions and it has a, a contour. So you could make your brush strokes follow the contours of the face. Or you could just patch in the light and dark shapes in the face. Um, if that's if I'm understanding that question correctly. Um, and I do a little bit of both. Um, sometimes your strokes need to be angled the same as the planes of the contours. Um, but sometimes it's, it can be a lot of fun and it can work really well to just blast in a big block of color somewhere. Not, you know, it doesn't have to be big. Um, so, so kind of both, you kind of feel out what you're doing and how it's coming together and you kind of figure out what the painting is needing at the time. So now I'm coming down to smaller and smaller brushes. I want this to look fuzzier. So I'm gonna take some background and I'm gonna intrude some background in to the uh, dandelion puff because it's kind of transparent. You know, I can see through it a little bit. I can see a little bit of kind of green, the inner core of there. But then there's areas where the light is hitting it where it's pretty, pretty opaque and pretty white. So, but the edge quality it's different from the edge quality of the glass, right? The glass has a very uh, 
very sharp, very hard edge because it goes from glass to nothing, right? Um, whereas this dandelion puff is very soft and its edge quality is, is just that. It's very soft. Softer, in fact, than the flower, which is also, you know, relatively soft compared to the glass. A little bit of my red that I did my initial drawing with is kind of showing through. And I am not mad at that. I kind of like that. It gives it a little bit of a warm glow, which I think is uh, kind of pleasing and adds a little bit of interest and complexity to the, this simple little painting. So what is the biggest misconception about what you do? Oh, uh, maybe that it's all painting. <laughs> uh, there's a tremendous amount of time that I spend um, not painting and doing other activities in support of, of painting. And whether it's, whether it's as simple as, as making an Instagram post or shipping, you know, packaging up some paintings for shipment. Um, you know, it's still stuff that you have to do. It still takes time. Um, those of you who are on Instagram, you know, they have this new thing called Reels where, you know, everybody's fascinated by these short videos. Um, you know, I had to start making reels, even though I think sometimes a lot of the reels that you see are a little bit silly. So I had to learn how to video, shoot video, and make maybe short instructional videos or little time-lapse videos. And it's fun and it's interesting, but it's not exactly painting. Mm. So I think a lot of people think, oh, you're an artist, you paint all the time. That isn't really true. Do you actually get to take time off during the year? <laughs> Um, I just do sometimes. Sometimes I'll paint. I'll go for a few days and I'll do a couple of paintings a day. We're actually going camping today. Oh, good. Um, and this, this painting I will probably post to Instagram tomorrow. Um, I'm bringing my paint stuff just because I enjoy it. Um, and I'll probably paint in my sketchbook, which I might post to uh, my social media accounts. Um, but they wouldn't be for sale. But that still is helpful because sometimes people like to see that kind of stuff. And it, it helps your uh, visibility and I guess your brand. <laughs> I hate using language like, oh yeah, my brand. Um, but you know, it's a, it's a real thing. You know, people want it, they're, they're used to seeing a certain thing on your social media and you can't, you can't neglect that. So um, yes, I do take time off, um, but it is rare that I will take time off completely. I'm usually doing something or I have some paintings in reserve to post, um, you know. So usually I have a half hour or so where I can sort of maintain my social media empire, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so one of the um, questions is that, just, how would you yeah. hang one of your paintings? Oh, that's a great question. I paint uh, you, my, my usual go-to size on these daily paintings are five by seven or six by eight. And those are standard sizes, which means that you can buy frames, nice frames relatively inexpensively um, for those sizes. So when I ship a painting, I don't, I do not advertise that I frame them. They're all unframed. So it's the responsibility of the buyer to frame them and display them because I am not a framer. Um, <laughs> But the standard size frames are a really, really good um, option for people. Um, I've also had people buy a whole collection of little paintings, like maybe little food paintings, and they'll, they'll uh, just put double back stick tape on them and just hang them as a little group, like in their kitchen or something. Oh, I love that. That's such a cool idea. What do you recommend when drawing a full body portrait? What tip do you recommend in drawing flow through a painting? Ah, so flow, that's also, I think, what we, we talk about as gesture. And it's very important. Um, and in fact, even in a simple painting like this, there's a certain amount of gesture happening in these stems, you know, just sort of the however graceful, you know, or ungraceful your uh, lines are going to be in your painting. Uh, and that mostly, I don't think there's a quick and easy answer to that question. It's just a matter of finding, um, you know, what works and what is going to, uh, you know, capture the movement of that particular pose that you're working with. It takes a lot of practice. Um, in general, though, you want to, uh, 
not use a bunch of short sort of staccato marks. You want to, you want to like say like, what's, what's the main line that starts from the farthest, the tallest point on the figure and extends to the lowest point. What's, is there a line that sort of follows that, um, that gesture? And you want to try and find that. And it takes, sometimes it takes some practice to consistently find that. Um, but everything that we do is, is doable. You know, we, we can find, we can get better at the stuff. And when you start doing something and it becomes frustrating, you know, that means you're learning. You know, that means you're in that moment when, you know, it's frustrating because you're in new territory. So if you're in a figure drawing class or you're just drawing the figure on your own and it starts to seem a little bit overwhelming, like you're not quite getting it, that's the time to really stick with it because that means things are starting to happen. Um, but figure drawing is very important and it takes time to learn. So you got to keep practicing it. Um, and even if you don't have access to a live model, get a, get a younger brother or a sibling or your mom or dad just to pose for you or, or you know, take a quick picture and use that if you have to. Now I'm switching to a teeny tiny little brush here. So I hope that answered your question. Um, sometimes I talk a lot and it doesn't seem like I get very far <laughs> answering things. Here's an interesting question. Have you ever repainted the bold and brash from SpongeBob? You've got me there. No, <laughs> I have not. <clears throat> and although I like SpongeBob, I don't think I'm even familiar with that, with what that is. I actually don't know what that is either. Yeah, so mostly what I paint is from life. Although another super fun thing that you can do is, you know, everyone's got Disney Plus or Hulu or Netflix. And as you know, you can pause that stuff at will. So I have sometimes paused movies, typically Star Wars movies, because I also am a Star Wars fan. And I'll just pause them and like do a painting of Boba Fett, you know, Boba Fett, I suppose is his name. Um, and that's really fun um, because, you know, cinematographers put a lot of time into lighting their subjects. And you can often... You know, a lot of that stuff is very dramatic, that thing, those things that you see in movies, um, because they've been professionally lit by people who light things up for their job. Um, but it's always fun. I like doing characters like that. And that's like, that's actually a real job, that kind of um, um, character developments and uh, painting and drawing for film, you know, whether it's backgrounds, uh, developing concepts for films, that's an actual job that you could have which, you know, it might've been fun to do, but I, I kind of like, I kind of like my job of just painting whatever I want. It's hard to beat that. Fade this cast shadow out a little bit, add a little bit of length to it. Well, speaking of, what is, what is the most rewarding and the most challenging thing about what you do? Uh, I would say, you know, the most rewarding thing and the thing that I still pursue on a daily basis is just to do a good painting. You know, my, my standards are probably a little bit different than, than a, a casual viewer of art, but I, you know, I just wanna do a painting that works on a variety of levels and that is satisfying to me. Like this one's got some potential. I did some things right in this one. And, and largely that's due to you guys because I'm moving pretty fast. And I have found that the faster I move, the more likely I am to do something I'm, I'm more or less satisfied with. Um, you know, and it's nice to sell a painting. That's always satisfying. That's always a fun, fun thing to happen. Um, but I would say just, just the personal satisfaction that comes from doing something that you like is pretty tough to beat. And of course, it's really nice when you have students who say, wow, uh, you know, that little tip that you just gave me changed everything for me. That's really fun, too. You know, you can make someone's process work a little bit better because of something you told them or shared with them. That's a lot of fun. Well, you're definitely getting a lot of positive feedback in the comments. <laughs> 
But one of the ones that just came across when painting fur, do you usually use a specific brush or is there a certain technique you use to paint fur? Well, I will say that painting fur is very, very similar to how I painted the fluff on this dandelion. And a lot of it has to do with your edge quality. And certainly uh, the brushes that I use, these are, these are I think, uh, these are synthetics. These are Jack Richardson brushes. They're, they're relatively expensive, but they're not as expensive as like natural fiber brushes, like a sable brush or a mongoose brush would be very, very much more expensive than this. Um, but soft brushes are a big help for getting those sort of soft edges. Um, but it is possible. There are painters who successfully paint fur and all they use is a knife. Isn't that crazy? Um, wow. So, and I, I got a little bit of a reflection from this flower kind of coming down the edge of this glass. That's why I'm in, inserting a bit of sort of yellow in here. Just a little bit though. Um, yeah, it depends on your tool. It depends on the scale of the piece, but it is certainly possible to paint fur with whatever tool you're comfortable with. Uh, just depends on kind of how you want to do it. I think this edge disappears. You know, it's glass, so, so you can see through it. So sometimes the edge of the glass is just, it's just gone. Let's see what happens if we get rid of that. That's a Bob Ross kind of thing to say and do. Let's see what happens if we do that. <laughs> just make that edge disappear completely. I had a painting teacher, a guy named Gary Pruner. He was a great painter and a wonderful mentor for me. He's since passed away. Uh, but he told us, he said, you know, of any object that you look at, probably at least 2% of the perimeter of that object is indistinguishable from the backgrounds. And at the time I thought, well, that is a crazy thing to say. 2% seems like an incredibly arbitrary number. And certainly it was. The point that he was making is that there are moments and there are areas where yes indeed the edge the contour of what you're painting or drawing becomes indistinguishable from the background and that happens relatively frequently with something like glass just because it is it is transparent it's kind of in the nature of that material to vanish um, and with fur too if we can go back to the fur thing you know, fur is soft and fuzzy. It doesn't have a hard, a hard terminator. You know, there's not a hard edge on the outside. It's, it's got lots of little fibers and hairs going off into space. And that becomes a very soft kind of blended edge. So it's probably painting something like fur that is very challenging, can be very challenging. It's probably more beneficial to really study the the sort of physics and the nature of what you're seeing than to you know think that you could rely on a specific tool that's going to get you the right result. You have to sort of see it and understand what's going on and then come up with a way to uh, mimic what you see. And that's another important thing that I, uh, that I learned. A great sort of concept is, you know, as, as much as we want to try and mix and match every little cut color and put down every single little detail, we're always going to fail. We're never going to get it exactly right. Uh, we're never going to be able to match that color exactly. And um, so what we're trying to do is to create a set of relationships that effectively mimic what we see in real life. We're setting up relationships, right? It's not, it's not the real thing. It's a it's a color next to another color that reminds you of what you see. It's never gonna be exactly what you see. We just have to rely on being able to, you know, jog our viewers memory and have them go, oh yeah, that resonates. I've seen something like that before. So we're uh, even, you know, some stuff like fur or hair or this dandelion puff. You know, I can't paint every single little puffy thing in there. I just have to kind of get it as close as I can. And I can see some background through there. So I can actually throw some background in. So in my book, 
I think I have, I think I just wrote a book and I don't even know how many projects I have. I think I have 22 projects in it where this is not, this is not one of them. I don't do a dandelion, but I do like a, I have a little jar with a paintbrush in it. I have a little chrome creamer. I've got a shoe, um, an apple, a hamburger, and I kind of walk uh, the readers through step by step how I approach that that painting or that um, that particular model. Uh, and I don't I, I hesitated to do a book like that because I don't believe that uh, painting is a recipe or a formula. We all have to sort of find our own way. There's a thousand ways to do this right. And you just what have to figure out the one. how do we find it? Uh, it is called um, The Beginner's Guide to Oil Painting. It's published by Page Street Publishing. And if you if you go to Amazon and you search for The Beginner's Guide to Oil Painting, it will come up. It's available for pre-order and it will be out uh, the 26th of this month. Oh, super exciting. So, yes, it's almost almost ready to go. So. Um, and I start with really, really simple stuff, just a few black and white paintings of very simple objects. And then I move on to much lim more, more limited color palette, like maybe just a couple of colors, warm a cool, a warm and a cool color. And by the end, we're doing a, a shoe and a hamburger and stuff that have a lot of colors in them. So it was a fun project, uh, but stressful. <laughs> I don't usually have that kind of deadline, but um, uh, it ended up being a very satisfying uh, process. Um, but I think, you know, the, the, the main thing I want from it is I want, I want it to get people's feet in the door. Because like I said, it's certainly not the last word on painting. Um, you know, there's a, there's a lot of painters who don't paint anything like how I paint. And they're really good painters and they're friends of mine. And, you know, and there's, they, they know, they would never argue with me. They know that the way they paint is also not the only way. The best way to find your way is to just start painting and figure it out, you know? And if you have a little bit of guidance so you can get some decent results early on, that just makes it easier to keep going. And that's really what the purpose of the book is, um, to give people a chance at succeeding so that they can, you know, they get a result that's pretty decent. And they go, yeah, it's not perfect, but I like this little part. I think I'll try that again. <laughs> Love that. So do you usually paint or do you sometimes paint animals and or dragons? Um, I don't know that I've ever painted a dragon. I have done a bunch of portraits of pets, um, both pets that are, that are my pets uh, and, and as commissions for other people, you know, dogs, a few cats. Um, I've done paintings of my chickens. Chickens make wonderful subjects. There are a lot of, lot of different colors. Um, let's see. I probably, I've done, <coughs> I've certainly done drawings of dragons before. I don't think I've ever painted. Oh, it's like a... But yeah, pets are, pets are a wonderful thing. To, uh, Frozen too, to when uh, they're going into that forest and then those colors, like pink, what was more colors than that? Like the All pink right. and blue. Kiana, can you mute? Are you asking a question? Okay. A lot so, uh, of your the, 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 resemble like frozen too. Hang on. <laughs> I can't tell if people are asking me stuff or if they're asking yeah, each I other. I think Kiana just hasn't muted. Fog. <laughs> I'm throwing a little bit of darker background color around. Is this at night or would you just? My flower because I want it to show up more. You know, I can make this light, bright right. passage of yellow show up better if I can surround it with a little bit darker background. All right, I think that I think I'm about done here. Awesome. The work is done. Well, of we course, it's in my nature time. to time. This has been continue amazing. To um, some people have commented in the chat and I would totally concur that this has been, it's been beautiful to watch this come to life. Absolutely amazing. Oh, well, thank you. Yeah. It's sometimes they look like, you know, they don't look great until the last five minutes, you know, <laughs> and then you're like, oh yeah, that worked out all right. <laughs> Love this. 
Wow. Well, thank you again for your time. I don't want to take up anybody else's time, but I really, really appreciate you guys. Thank you for coming. I hope everybody got the questions answered and got to see um, this beautiful art piece come to life too. Um, and on that note, happy Friday, everybody. I hope you have a wonderful spring break and a wonderful weekend. And I hope this was a fantastic way to head into your weekend. <laughs> Well, thank you very much, guys. It was really, really fun. I, I like to paint and I like to talk about painting. So it was a great opportunity. Thank you very much. Yes, this was fantastic. Thank you. All right, guys, go check out his Instagram. He has a um, he has a website as well, Craig Stevens Art. Oh. And here's what my book looks like. Can you guys yeah. see it? Perfect. So yeah, it's on.